Thanks to everybody for a, such a warm welcome. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, in Phoenix. I know several of you in the audience um, and online. Um, it's nice to be able to greet you virtually and in real time. So that's something that's quite exciting. As Dave said in the introduction, I wanted to try and talk today about some of the lessons that we've learned from end-to-end -end workflows, particularly what we can gain from lessons learned from the commercial printing space and how we can apply those to the world of textile printing. Adobe Technology has been used for many years uh, as part of its end-to-end -end solution. Um, we're very familiar uh, to a lot of people for our creative tools, uh, things like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator. Um, some of our less known technologies might be like the Adobe PDF Print Engine, which is based on exactly the same technology as we have in these desktop applications, but actually takes that same core, the same intelligence, and actually applies it to the world of print and indeed to manufacturing. And of course, you've all heard of uh, PDF files, the portable document file format that allows the transfer between these two worlds. And actually, as we've seen how print has, has evolved over the years, we think there's a lot of very relevant technologies that we've actually been able to bring to the world of textile printing as well. And as Dave said in his introduction, I've been working in the, in the textile space for about four or five years now, and we've been able to identify some very, very key areas about how the, the differences and yet similarities between these two worlds allow us to move forward. If we think about printing in general and the process for taking somebody's design, somebody's artwork, and then reproducing it in another, in another media, in another form, sometimes in volume. Over the last decades, hundreds of years, in some cases millennia, we've developed a bunch of different techniques for capturing some piece of information, some piece of artwork, and reproducing it. And we've evolved somewhat from the idea of monks transcribing Bibles in, in abbeys up in the mountains, you know, through various technologies. And as technology has evolved, so has the printing industry also evolved to leverage the technology as it's come along. It doesn't matter if it's movable type or lithography or the engraving of rollers. We've been able to take the technology and then actually bring it to bear as a way of turning something that somebody has designed into some repeatable piece of artwork. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, we saw a lot of the emergence of the use of computing in the information industry. Um, some of you will, may well have been around at this point, if you have grey hair or lack of hair like me. We were used to the idea of beginning to use computers in the world of design. Right? How could we actually take artwork, which sometimes we would we'd start off by creating or with pen and ink or crayons or paints, how can we bring it into a computer? How can we sometimes design originally within a computer and then actually somehow take that artwork and manufacture it? And that's actually where the world of Adobe Postscript came in. Actually, that's the technology that Adobe was founded on over 35, closer to 40 years ago now. This language which allowed information to be conveyed off the screen and transfer it from the world of the, the creator to the world of manufacturing. And actually the photo there is of an Apple laser writer. It's one of the very, very first printers that had the Adobe Postscript technology inside. And it was coupled with the world of the um, Apple Macintosh as a way of a designer being able to take something off their screen and physically hold it in their hands. So. Technologies like Adobe Illustrator were created originally as a way of getting this, these digital designs created by a producer, an artist, a creative in some form, allowing them to capture words, but also illustrations, images, sketches, gradients, etc. in full color, and then transfer that using Adobe Postscript to a printer. Now, one very important thing about this particular industry, as it evolved, obviously, we gained more higher quality. Um, we, uh, we gained the ability to print in color. One of the things that Adobe Postscript allowed the designer to do as well was to also convey information about how this piece that they were designing was to be manufactured. Think about this in terms of the printer you might have at home. Back in the 1980s, uh, when the Apple Laser Writer, Laser Writer came out, it printed in black and white on one side of a piece of paper and you were done. So there's nothing particularly complicated about that. But if you think about how you would print today at home, maybe you want to be able to print on both sides of a sheet of paper. Maybe you want to be able to print on uh, in color. Maybe you want to be able to um, create booklet, booklets or some, some other form. You want to sort of convey how, not just for what it is you want to design, but how should it be printed? How should it be manufactured as well? 
And PostScript allowed us to do this. It allowed us to control, send controls down from the operator of a computer to a printer and actually control the process, not just control the information actually that they actually wanted to reproduce. So this is a bit of a double-edged sword. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's good because now we can transfer information off the screen and reproduce it in some way. But the danger and the problem with Adobe PostScript was that actually it wasn't easy to repurpose the information and actually take the information from one printer, move it to another. Imagine, for example, what does it mean if you try and tell a printer to print in colour, but this colour can only print in black and white. That's not particularly useful to you. So one of the things that Adobe did then uh, was to come up with this idea of the portable document format, Adobe PDF. And what was cool about Adobe PDF was, first of all, it allowed us to keep all the information about the artwork, about the design that the creative was actually uh, designing, and separate it from the information of how it was to be reproduced. So separating the what from the how, if you like. And the good thing about this is that it meant that the PDF file could be viewed on any type of device. You could print it on any type of printer, you can view it on a screen, Indeed, that's what it was used for originally. It was the idea of how do you get this document, which otherwise you would print on paper, and make it shareable. This was even before the days of the internet. How could you share it and view it on a screen? And of course, later on, the internet revolution, of course, is uh, somewhat advanced by now. We're all used to the idea of exchanging a PDF file as a way of viewing information, of sharing it, but preserving the original form. You think about the, the difference between looking at a page in a web browser and looking at a page in a PDF file. You know that whenever you see a PDF file, the layout that you see, the positioning of, of graphics and images and this sort of thing, is always preserved. The designer's intent is always preserved. And that's a very important thing to learn as we, and apply as we go forward, this idea that we can preserve this information in the original form that designer created and always at the highest level of abstraction. So we can always create it, at the, print it or reproduce it in the highest quality possible. And this is really important when it comes to textile printing, even more so when we talk about digital textile printing. I'm going to talk today about these three different segments. Now, the idea that, as we've spoken about earlier today, that there are different applications for um, manufacturing and when it comes to digital textile printing. We'll talk about direct-to-garment and the roll-to-roll -roll market and cut and sew, and we'll see how these different types, these different segments within the textile industry are similar and how they differ. If we think about the direct-to-garment market, what we're really talking about here is a situation where the garment, frankly, has already been made. It's already been assembled. It's been, uh, the fabric has been cut, it's been sewn together, and we have a final product, almost. All but for the graphics. And of course, what we're doing with Design to Garment is we're taking something, be it a baby grow or a child's t-shirt, a lady's t-shirt, or maybe in this case, a polo shirt that this gentleman is wearing. It's been produced in its base form in one location. And actually now we actually want to apply some graphics, some decal, some color, some print, some design. Well, one of the important things that comes to re when it comes to reproducing graphics, in this case, an artist has created a picture of a unicorn. They have this unicorn, the colors of that unicorn are very important to them. The style, the brush strokes that we see here in the mane of the unicorn and in its tail are very important. This is what they're trying to convey. This is the essence of the design they have. And in the same way we can think about a PDF file being seen on a screen or different printers, and we're used to the idea of reproducing it at different sizes, the same is also applied when we're using PDF for direct-to-garment printing. Think of the difference between printing a t-shirt digitally and printing it with a, a screen print, for example. If you were to do a screen print of a design like this unicorn, then once you actually you've imaged your screen, you're at a fixed size. You can't take that screen and apply it at one size on a baby grow, on another size on a lady's shirt, and then on a pocket on, in a, on this gentleman's polo shirt. You'd have to throw that screen away and remake it. If you're working with image files or raster files, you'd have to recreate the artwork which was to be reproduced. But by using a digital file like a PDF, you can reproduce that at any size and with any technology where you, you, that you need to to print on a different type of product. The other thing as well from a color perspective is we can be very careful about managing the colors that are being reproduced. So it doesn't matter whether or not we're printing on a polyester polo shirt or a cotton t-shirt. If we're careful about how we define the colors in the PDF, we can reproduce those colors accurately whether we're printing on a different type of fabric or with a different dyed ground with, on a different solid color. We can manage that color process when it comes to reproduction. We'll talk about that in a bit more in a, in a second. So that's the direct-to-garment market. There seems to be a very, very similar 
uh, technology used here as you might have seen when you're printing a document at home on a, on, a, on a home printer. And in fact, you can even get fabrics for your home printers, and I know people do this, where you print onto a domestic printer and use a transfer to transfer it onto an existing garment that you have. When we talk about the roll-to-roll -roll market, we're actually sort of stepping up the technology somewhat and everything gets a little bit more complicated. Very often when we're talking about roll-to-roll, -roll and, and Hitoshi and other speakers have talked about this today, we're talking about the idea of printing across the entire width of a roll of fabric before we even make the garment. And of course when we're printing on a roll of fabric, a roll of fabric can be of any length. It doesn't matter if we're printing 3 feet, 3 yards, 300 yards, 3,000 yards, 3 miles. We can take the same design and repeat it. And as others have said already today, the idea of printing digitally means we're not actually encumbered by having a minimum run length. We can print as little as three feet or as much as we like. There is no setup cost which is affecting the price of the manufacturing process. It's the same price per feet, per foot, if you're printing three feet or 3,000 feet, as far as the equipment is concerned, because the setup cost doesn't exist. And actually to Hitoshi's comment, uh, I think it was Hitoshi in the uh, panel session earlier, talking about you want to be able to touch a fabric. One of the advantages of having digitally printed fabric is because you don't have to pay to engrave that roller. You don't have to incur a lot of cost if all you want to do is a small strike-off. It actually becomes cost-effective to print a sample or a strike-off on the actual same device as you would use to do your final manufacturing run which it doesn't tend to be the case when you're printing in analog. It's very expensive to print an analog roller just to do a test run of three feet. Anyway, we digress. Let's come back to this technology and what it can do for us. When we're printing roll to roll, very often we're repeating a fabric. We're kind of emulating the world of analog printing. We may well have variations in our design across the width of the roll of the fabric, but very often we repeat a design every so many inches, feet or yards as we go down. That's only because we're replicating what we would have done previously with an analog process. In a repeat like this, and I've shown something quite stylized here, what you're looking at actually is the idea that a particular motif will be repeated in sort of a stamp form across an area of fabric. In this case, we're showing a half drop. We're actually taking each, each image, each image group, and we're offsetting it by a half as we go down by stamping this square and dropping it by, by a half every time we go across, this is a half drop. What's important about this when we're talking about the creation of digital content is very often designers will be asked to submit their design at a particular resolution, create an image file at a particular resolution, and they might be told to do it at 200 dots per inch or 300 dots per inch or 150 dots per inch. There's an inherent problem though in terms of this fixation that we have about images and in terms of referring to dots per inch. And that's that we're throwing information away. If I think about what this design looks like at a particular resolution, as I, want, as I reduce the number of dots per inch, we're talking about removing the information density per square inch. And while that might be really good for reducing file size, it also actually means we're throwing information away. That can cause problems later on, particularly if we want to reuse this particular piece of artwork printed at a different size, or maybe we don't exactly know what the technology that will be used to reproduce this design. One problem I saw this even this morning, um, after one of the, the speakers um, was, was sharing their presentation, I went to an online uh, digital textile ordering um, site, I tried to upload my image that I'd created previously, but I couldn't actually get it to marry the resolution of my image and the size that I knew I had a four inch repeat. I couldn't actually persuade the website to actually print this design as a four inch repeat. And one of the reasons for that was the fact that we'd got this resolution being locked in place. But the, the other issue that we have when we have these different images at different resolutions, or we're having to guess what process we're going to be printing on downstream, is that it means we're throwing away information. It makes it very difficult, actually, to print at different sizes later on. So the same image, if I take the same images as I had earlier, and I blow them up so they're actually the same size, then you can see in this stylized illustration here, the same Kingfisher image here, if I take that lower resolution, that 70 DPI image, but I try and make it larger, I've actually got something that's quite blurred. And actually the danger is, is that this is gonna be visible when I try and print this with my particular technology. Think of a situation where maybe you're trying to take the same print and you're using it for multiple applications. Maybe you're using it on a bed cover 
and you also want to be at a relatively small size, but I actually want a larger version of this print, maybe for some drapes or for the uh, wall covering behind my bed. If I want to blow it up and make it larger and show it somewhere else within my room, and I had this lower resolution um, or have less information, it's really difficult to actually repurpose that design at another size later on. I might be able to try and change the resolution, converting it, but there's no new information I have available. I might be able to print something at a smaller scale, effectively call this downsampling, throwing information away, I can do that. But the danger is, is that if I went to try and reproduce that, that lower downsampled image at a higher resolution later, frankly, I can't, all right? If I were to attempt to do it, I'd have a much lower quality result. So this conversion to, of, of our artwork to images is really problematic. It gets worse even when we start talking about compressed images. Very often designers will be asked, told that when they want to share their image they have to have a maximum file size and they'll use compression techniques to try and reduce the file size to make sure that the file can be uploaded. Um, some of the websites allow you to JPEG, JPEG compress an image. It's the same compression you would use in a digital camera, for example, to share this image with some other part of the manufacturing process. This is really, really dangerous. I'll say it again. It's really, really dangerous. Um, I've shown an exaggerated version here. The problem you have with JPEG compression is that you're really throwing away a lot of information. You see this square blocking effect and this sort of fuzzy noise that's been introduced. Well, that's the same technology that's being used in a digital camera maybe, but when you try and apply it to something that's, be, that's going to be reproduced on, on textiles, particularly, particularly at these relatively low resolutions, there's a lot of danger that noise is going to get introduced. In this particular case, we're looking at a, at a complete image. Um, we're used to the idea of possibly being able to Jacob, JPEG compress photos. This gets quite dangerous though when we try and think about this in terms of vector or graphical artwork that you might have drawn by free by hand. The sharp edges in this particular example of, of an inset of our flower, you can see the edges of the brush strokes that have been designed within the computer. They're very sharp, they're very accurate. We've got some nice curves here. If we convert this vector piece to an image, then you'll see that this blurring is beginning to get introduced at the edges as we've turned this from a vector into an image. Well, we see this stepping, this fuzziness that's happening around the outside. What's even worse is when we try and compress this to a JPEG. Right? The idea that this noise is being introduced to try and make the file size smaller. Not only are we actually distorting the edges of these sharp curves, we're actually introducing colors which never existed in the original artwork. In this particular case, the artist was using a palette of what, eight different colors? And if you look closely on the right hand side of the image here, you'll see that the compression of JPEG has actually introduced some colors that never existed in the original design from the artist. So what's the manufacturing process supposed to do with this? It really becomes a problem of being ambiguous about the colors that we're trying to reproduce. So this whole problem about converting to images and compressing has a myriad of different problems we'll get picked up on later on in, within the manufacturing process. What's important, and one of the new elements that we can bring if we're using PDF as a way of representing our files, is it doesn't matter what type of original artwork is being used, we can actually store the vectors or the photographic images or the vector or the scans of the artwork at their original size within the PDF file and delay the decision about what resolution it should be converted to at print time until we actually get to the printer. This frees us up from the idea of thinking about the printer needs 300 DPI or the three, printer needs 200 DPI. By using a PDF file, we are freed from that particular constraint. We don't have to worry about that. We can put as much information, as much detail about the feathers of this hummingbird, for example, into our print in a PDF file and leave it to the manufacturing process to extract the right amount of information for whatever the manufacturing process happens to be. The other advantage of this, as I talked about the idea of the bed cover and the wall color covering earlier on, is it means we can reproduce this design at any particular grade or scale or size later on if that information is being preserved. So that's a little bit about you know, the, the, the value of preserving the original content of the image. Let's talk about color for a second. So when it talks about comes to communicating color, we've really got this world of matching the world of the brand, the world of the designer, with the world of the manufacturing process. And again, the panel spoke about this very eloquently earlier on today. There's some key problems that we tend to see and come across when it comes to how do you communicate the color that the designer is expecting or that the brand is expecting and actually convey that to manufacturing process. 
There are a couple of areas where we see some very, very common mistakes. As was said earlier, commonly we'll design, our designers will design in terms of RGB, red, green and blue colours. And this makes total sense. It, that's after all what you're going to see on your screen. And whether you're scanning or whether you're creating original artwork on a computer, defining colours in terms of RGB makes total sense. The problem comes along when we're imprecise and we don't define what do we mean by red? What do we mean by green? What do we mean by blue? If we don't define what these colours mean at the starting point, then how do we know we can re faithfully reproduce these colours later on? Refer this to this commonly as untagged RGB. It's quite easy to find a, a, a software application which will create a, a, an RGB image which you could send to a mill but that doesn't actually define what is actually meant by red, green, and blue. And that's going to be a big cause of a lot of the problems that we see in digital textile workflows. There are other problems that we see as well, and I've actually had some uh, first-hand experiences of brands that have actually um, had this particular problem, where they think, well, we're printing, so we need to convert our colours to CMYK. It was actually a well-known brand who I won't name, who said, told all their artists, well, you can de design in, in uh, RGB, design whatever you like, but before you print, convert everything to CMYK. But they didn't define what they meant by cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. They didn't even insist that you actually had a well-known definition of red, green, and blue in the first place. And what's more, actually, even if you did push them further, they didn't know what technology was going to be used to manufacture the, the, pro the design later on. They didn't know what shade of cyan was actually going to be used in the actual printer. So again, we have this problem where we weren't being very precise about the, the colors that were going to be reproduced. So how can we expect to delight the customer with what they see on the screen matching what it is they get printed in an e-commerce environment if as designers and manufacturers, we're not being precise about what we mean by color? These were some points very well made earlier. Fortunately, we can, we can solve these problems by being explicit about what we mean by color. And we heard earlier this idea about using a source profile, using color profiles, ICC profiles while we're designing to actually control the color process, calibrating monitors, etc. But what's important, what's very important, is if we're using a profile to define our colors, we need to make sure we, we provide that as metadata, as information downstream to the manufacturing process. So we've got a consistent understanding of what we mean when we're actually referring to a particular color. Now that works very well for, for photographic work, for example. A lot of brands will use colour standards when it comes to defining particular palettes for an upcoming season, or they are um, uh, perhaps matching a, a house colour, or they're specifying colours, particularly if you're going to mix um, colours which might be reproduced digitally, or maybe um, dyed solids, for example. Somebody mentioned uh, CSI, Colour Solutions International, earlier on today. A uh, nice little company in North Carolina. We've worked with them very closely in the past. Brands will use companies like Color Solutions International to actually define what particular colors mean. In this case, particular shade of red. And as we saw, we print them on a particular, uh, get a particular sample, particular card, attached to a particular card that actually allows us to name a particular color and use a, a common definition of what this color means all the way through the workflow. If I refer to, in this case, um, crayon red is what I've got on my card. This particular card has a little number associated with it, the one you see on the screen. If we keep the name of the, of the color associated all the way through the workflow, and we all use the common understanding of what that color means, again, we have a lot better chance of being able to faithfully reproduce that color later on. And I make this comment about don't rely on RGB and CMYK approximations. There are certain providers that you can use who will give you a little color chip and they'll tell you that, oh, this is the same as RGB1925547 or it's the same as CMYK, blah, 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 right? The problem is if we return, try and refer to this color in terms of its RGB numbers or its CMYK numbers, we've lost this association between the color you're actually trying to reproduce faithfully, this color standard, and we've now turned it into this number which could get mangled, processed, changed, however we don't know, later on within the process. So it's always important to make sure we keep the name of the color and follow that all the way through the workflow as well. We can actually go beyond just using the name and actually um, another technology which is increasingly in popularity is the idea of defining uh, colors in terms of their spectral properties. 
In other words, looking at a particular color that may have been measured, a color standard, and measuring how it reacts at a range of different frequencies. Uh, we talked about the idea of, uh, in the panel session, about um, light, light, light source object and observer. So the, idea, the cool thing about spectral color is it allows us to look at how this color is actually behaving in a particular lighting condition and actually then use that in the manufacturing process to actually know that actually we're manufacturing a color and how that color will, should look, should, should look under different lighting conditions, which means we can use it for quality assurance as well within the manufacturing process. It's a very, very important technique. But what's important and the benefit that we're getting from using a PDF file to store the colors for our design as well, is what we can put all these color profiles information into the PDF file and it can travel alongside the artwork. We can even have different parts of our design being tagged with different ICC profiles. We could use a different profile, in this case for a particular bit of text, or this other profile for the hummingbird. We could, it could be the same for some other part, a graphical element. By having different ICC profiles and defining how this object was originally designed, we can convey that to the downstream manufacturing process and actually then reproduce the color that was expected. What we can also do is take with spectral color information, this brand color information. You might know it as a QTX, if you've come across a QTX file, if you're measuring a color using a, um, a data color colorimeter, for example. CXF is also a, a format for spectral color, which is supported within the PDF file. You can embed this color spectral information within the same PDF file and communicate that all the way through from design through to manufacturing. And if we do this, we've got a much better chance of being able to print either using an analog process and batching a color, using it for quality assurance, or printing digitally on a range of different devices, even viewing these colors on the screen and predicting how would this color look if it were in um, an indoor lighting, a uh, tungsten light? How would it look if it were outside in a bright light? We can actually apply these different changes and actually predict how the color is gonna look or how it should be seen in different conditions. So that's another part of the roll-to-roll the, um, -roll workflow. Let's talk about cut and sew for a minute. So in the cut and sew market, something that differentiates us from the previous um, examples is that we don't have a finished garment at this point, a finished product that we're making, but we do have an idea of a garment that we are going to be making. And in that environment, actually, we have the ability to print digitally, but only print as much fabric as we need to make a particular garment. Now, this is what's powering a lot of the e-commerce, the uh, make one, the uh, the creator being able to manufacture something to match exactly the requirements of their customers. And only when they need that particular garment, when they order that particular garment, we don't have to keep warehouses full of inventory uh, made in bulk a long time in advance. We know this is some of the benefits of using digital printing, but the cut and sew market is actually has some very particular nuanced needs when it comes to digital printing. It might be that we actually want to print on the top right hand side here. Um, this is an example from um, Akeep Athletics down in uh, Los Angeles. They are printing custom uh, sportswear. And in this particular case, you're seeing some examples where they're printing uh, the, the pieces that are needed, which they're gonna cut out and sew together to make, I'm assuming this is swimwear. I might imagine that some of this could be face masks, but probably not. Um, I probably wouldn't look so good in these either, but you get the general idea. They're printing very, very efficiently. They're only printing as much fabric as they need to fulfill the order that they have. And they're actually able to nest the pieces that they are, they are manufacturing on a single piece of fabric, reducing the wastage. The same thing might be true if we're actually printing, let's say, an, uh, uh, shirts for an entire soccer team. Uh, in this particular case, we want to print the shirts at different sizes, offer them at different sizes. We might want to have different names on the back, but actually, the, the size of that name and the size of the number on the jersey needs to be consistent. So when we, in this cut and sew market, one of the things we want to be able to do is to actually print at these different grades on demand and maybe only print the right sizes for the right players in this particular team, rather than have to manufacture a lot of stuff in advance and then try and find the closest match and then sew a name on later. We can actually digitally print the, um, the kit for the entire team all at once and manufacture it so they're all using exactly the same colors. Now, if we think about how this actually works in practice, here's a lady wearing a tank top. This is 
um, actually manufactured by our friends at Zazzle.com. In this particular case, when you think about how this is going to be manufactured, you need two pieces, right? You need a front and a back. Um, in this case, you've got a, a front panel, which is going to have a deeper neck scoop. The back panel is going to have a small indentation for the back of the neck. And we actually need to manufacture two panels, which we're going to cut out and sew together later. Now, you remember we were talking a little bit earlier on in the... Um, in the examples are at roll to roll, we, sometimes we're concerned about the file size. You know, what techniques can we use to try and make the file size smaller so that we can transmit? Ideally, what we want to be able to do if we want to manufacture a number of jerseys or a number of shirts, and actually particularly where we've got to repeat, is we only really want to be able to store this information once. We don't really want to have to repeat the, this information multiple times. If we're repeating the same information multiple times, we're kind of wasting size, wasting space, in terms of this file. And one of the advantages that we have when we're using PDF is that we only actually have to store this information once, no matter how many times it might appear in the final product. This makes the PDF file very, very efficient when it comes to file size. We can use this in the roll-to-roll -roll environment, but it becomes even more interesting when we apply it to the cut and sew market. If you think about what we would need to print to print to manufacture, let's say this lady orders uh, two tank tops, we need to print two fronts and two backs. What we can do when it comes to manufacturing this particular piece, representing it and conveying it to the print equipment, is store the information only once. We want to apply a rotation so that the back panel is actually printed upside down. It's actually okay as far as the direction of the weave and the fabric is concerned because it's actually the, um, consistent across the width but we can apply this rotation and actually be sure that uh, we're going to get exactly the right print that we need. But what's important here, and if you look closely, you'll see that the shells of the back panels have actually been rotated by 180 degrees. So we're not just printing the back panel of this tank top with a rotation. The print that's going to be placed on it needs to be rotated as well. But the important thing here is that inside this PDF file, then we're only storing the back outline once, we store the front outline once, and we only have a single instance of this repeated image, this repeated tile, makes for a really, really efficient file size when it actually comes to sharing this PDF file downstream. But this PDF file is production ready. We can send this file directly to production. Further, what's really exciting about using this type of technique is that we can send that same PDF file, this same common definition of the truth, and we can send the PDF file both to our printing equipment and to our cutting equipment. The printing equipment is going to look at the area that it needs to be reproduced on the fabric and print that at exactly the right size, whatever size has been defined in the PDF file in this particular case. But the same PDF file can be used to convey the outline, the cutting information that is actually required by the cutting equipment, and extract that and send that to the cutting part of, of, the, um, of the workflow as well. So it becomes very, very important metadata that we can extract and again have this common single definition of truth that we can use all the way through our workflow. Because we don't need separate files, we don't have to worry about losing something, we don't have to worry about the fact that we might have changed the format as we um, create these, these variations, we haven't got to worry about whether they're going to line up or not. By keeping this same piece of truth all in the same file, we have this very, very powerful solution. So combining all these things to together, you know, these different properties of preserving the original content, its original full fidelity, this efficient file size that we get by being able to reuse the same information however much we need it in manufacturing, this idea of preserving metadata for manufacturing, uh, including for the cut and sew market, and accurately representing the colours are really important things that makes a PDF file pretty powerful. Now, before I go, I can't help but, um, but mention how we, we as Adobe fit into this story as well. So we have our PDF print engine, which actually, as I mentioned at the beginning, is using the same technology that we have in our creative tools. This idea that not only are we using now the same single source of truth all the way through the workflow, from design through managing, maybe seeing a PDF file on the screen, um, all the way through to manufacture, across a range of different substrates and a range of different de de devices. We're not just conveying the same file all the way through the workflow, but because we've made our Adobe technology available to all the different players, be it the designer, be it the manager who's approving or managing the, the, um, the files, or even to the mill that's doing the manufacturing, 
we've got the same technology being used as well as the same file being used all the way through the workflow, which is really, really powerful and really important. The PDF print engine is at the heart of many of the solutions that are used for digital printing today. Um, it powers many of the digital front ends that are available, uh, the RIPs, the DFEs that you might be using in front of a digital printer. Some of them are embedded within the print system themselves and others are available as an option. Between them, these different uh, digital front end technologies are capable of driving a wide range of different digital printers. In case, actually in some cases, even some of the analog screen printers as well. This isn't an exhaustive list, there are many others available as well. But you see, by having the same technology at the heart of the manufacturing process, we know we can start thinking, we've got the tools available to give us a chance of being consistent. And as I mentioned a second ago, the same digital front ends are actually also, you can use the information they're extracting from a PDF file to drive those cutters. So we've got the same information being used to cut out the fabric. Like I said, not an exhaustive list but there's some very, very powerful consistency that's being powered by these solutions. So that's the manufacturing end of the pipeline. Of course, at the creative end of the pipeline, the, the tools being used by the designers in their studios and by brands. Um, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator have already been mentioned today. Uh, many people are familiar with these. They're being used by designers of textiles and prints to produce the artwork, uh, maybe scan, maybe uh, digitize um, some work that's been done by hand or otherwise create stuff that's been used on the screen. So we have some core technology available in just for regular Adobe Photoshop and the Adobe um, Illustrator tools. But as some others have mentioned, sometimes for the world of textile design, we need some additional tools, some additional capabilities, some additional management of colorways, for example. And actually what I'm very excited to be announcing today, and you're the first audience to hear this, um, are some exciting new collaborations that Adobe has entered into with Aquario Design and with Ned Graphics. These are two creators of software which are widely used and available for the designers of textiles and prints. We've actually licensed Adobe technology to Aquario Design. We have, they've mentioned the Adobe Textile Designer at the beginning of the presentation. So we've licensed Adobe Textile Designer technology to Aquario, which they're bringing to market and embedding within their software solutions. And going forward, both of these products, both Aquario and Ned Graphics, are optimizing their software tool chains to be optimized for exporting PDF, which will be compatible with the Adobe PDF print engine as well. So there we are, some benefits of using PDF technology throughout the supply chain, all the way from design to manufacture. Hope that's been enlightening for you. Uh, if you want any more information, there's a website available today. Um, you can go and take a look at this, adobe.com forward slash go forward slash textiles. More information about what we've been doing there, who our partners are, how you can reach out to them. And if you'd like to send us an email, feel free to email us at textileprinting at adobe.com.